Okay. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. Welcome on this lovely Friday the 13th morning when many people think of bats as scary, scary creatures and we welcome the presence of bats and celebrate the presence of bats as such a valuable part of our ecosystem. So we're excited that you're joining us this morning to talk about bats. And my name is Victoria Alzapiti. I'm the president of Friends of Buttonhook Forest. And as you may know, we are a community grassroots organization and we're working to save, protect and preserve the Buttonhook Forest, which is a 20 acre forest, an incredible wildlife habitat, beautiful native trees, mature trees, uh, you know, really a wonderful resource in our watershed. So amazing importance on a water level, on, on a habitat level, um, full of wildlife, wild birds, owls, hawks, foxes, coyotes, incredible mammals, including an animal that we don't often think of as a mammal, which is our, our friend, the bat. Um, and we also have at Buttonhook Forest, which many of you may know, something that makes it even more unique and precious, which is that it is a sacred Native American ceremonial stone site. Uh, so very, very important on a cultural, historical level to preserve that space as well for our Native American brothers and sisters. So here we are today. Um, in addition to the Friends of Buttonhook Forest sponsoring this event, we have really wonderful co-sponsors. I uh, want to give them a shout out. Um, Newcastle Healthy Yards, which works to make yards healthy, no pesticides. And we know that it's really important for bats to not have pesticides and to have native plants. Uh, so thank you to that group for co-sponsoring. Thank you to Newcastle Pollinator Pathways for co-sponsoring. A lot of people don't realize that bats are pollinators. So it's wonderful to have that alliance as well. And to the Nature of Westchester, which is a larger group of, you know, about 4,400 or so uh, residents around the county of Westchester. And we have bats all over, as we know. So shout out to all these great organizations to collaborate, to support bats. And we are thrilled today to be here with this wonderful organization, um, the Gotham Bat Conservancy. They are doing incredible work. We were thrilled to find them. We were hearing bats around Buttonhook Forest and we thought, let's learn more about them. And we were so happy, such a gift to, to find you all um, and to reach out to give us more information about bats and, and um, what their habitat needs are, how we can support them. So I wanna take a minute to please introduce our guests. Um, you know, it's wonderful when you find people who are true experts in their field. And the two experts with us today are the co-founders of the Gotham Bat Conservancy, Ryan Mahoney. Ryan's background in wildlife biology includes bioacoustics, both with bats and marine mammals, environmental science, marine science, wildlife biology, and conservation biology. Ryan is also one of the co-founders, as we said, of the Gotham Bat Conservancy, which was founded in, in response to the destructive white nose syndrome and the widespread destruction of bat habitats and serves as the president and principal biologist for the organization. And we also have with us Roxanne Quilty. Roxanne is also a co-founder of the organization. She's a passionate advocate for social and environmental justice with a diverse background in political advocacy, social marketing, and project management. She's dedicated her career to causes such as mental health activism, supporting queer and POC candidates for political office and climate change and wildlife conservation advocacy. So as you can tell, they are amazing and we're thrilled to have them with us. And with no further ado, I turn it over to both of you. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, we're so happy to be here. Good morning, Thanks everybody. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And... Okay. First step down. All right, everyone can see it. Everyone can see. <laughs> All right, excellent. Awesome. So... Well, thank you, Victoria, for that beautiful intro. Absolutely. Thank um, you. We're so thrilled to be here today. We were so thrilled to um, hear from you guys and to learn about this uh, vital piece of land. And we're, you know, equally as passionate about protecting it. So thank you guys so much for bringing us into this uh, fight for this land. And we're really um, happy to contribute in any way we can. And today that looks like uh, chatting about the beautiful bats that live there. So let's do it. So just a little bit, a little bit about us as an organization. 
we're just a, a year old. We're a baby organization. Um, we were founded last year in response to the white nose syndrome endemic, which we'll get more into detail about later on in our presentation and just the wider disruption of bad habitats throughout the Northeast and really the world. Um, the work that we do uh, is many fold, but our areas of focus are in research and in bat monitoring. Those things we'll also get a little more into detail about later on, but just to scratch the surface, um, we monitor bats all throughout the city and the greater New York and uh, tri-state area um, using mostly bioacoustic methods. So we do have other methods. Um, to check in on the status of bats and their population um, and inform how best we can take action to protect them. And uh, yeah, another huge component of our work is in education and the dispelling of misinformation. I'm sure you guys, everyone here knows that bats are very maligned creatures and um, it's a super important moment in time that we uh, let people know the reality behind bats and not just the myths that they've been taught. Um, yeah, we educate on the central role of bats. We also provide materials and resources and support for ecological restoration. And yeah, our whole goal is to bolster the bat population in New York and beyond. Next slide, please, sir. Oh, these are just cute pictures of us doing some of our work. <laughs> I love them. Yeah, so... Um... This is just kind of like a little overview of some of the things that we've been doing. So uh, this is a picture of me and uh, Ariel, who's one of the interns that we had this summer that helped us do bat monitoring at some of the state properties in Long Island. Um, the other like darker picture is uh, the rest of us, the little group that was out there that night in Kinequat River State Park. Um, which is a pretty large park, uh, cruising around and looking for bats. On the lower left is one of the um, nature walks that we led this summer in uh, Marine Park in Brooklyn, where we went out and we showed a group of people how to look for and identify uh, sleeping bats and the, the areas that you might look to find them and how to look for them without disturbing them. And then the lower right is Roxanne. One we were out in, uh, this is actually when we were in Pennsylvania doing bat monitoring for another state property out there uh, to identify some of the species of bats that they have on a wildflower preserve. And then this is a a quick little overview of the different species of bats that we've identified in some of the parks that are in New York City. Um, we're, we're located in New York City, so this is where we've done a lot of our monitoring work for the NA Bat Program, which is a program that's administered by the United States Geological Survey to start creating a um, a national database of bat data, uh, including like sightings, uh, mist netting, and acoustic data to get a baseline and then to start monitoring changes over time throughout the whole country. And we're in charge of the New York City region, collecting that data and submitting it to them. So as you can see from here, we've found some really cool stuff like uh, one might assume that New York City is not the most hospitable environment for bats, but to the contrary, uh, most of the bats that are in the Northeast, we have identified in just this season in New York City. Um, the little brown bat, which is a species of concern right now, it's not doing the best. Um, and some endangered species like the Northern long-eared bat, uh, the Indiana bat, uh, the tricolor bat, which is in the process of being, uh, it's proposed as endangered, so it's not protected just yet, but that's most likely going to be happening in the very near future. So lots of cool stuff we found in New York City and around New York City, which we'll get to in a little bit. 
So okay, so we're gonna talk about some of the basics of these beautiful little creatures. So the Latin name for bat is Chiroptera, which means uh, hand wing. I just love this slide because it shows the immense similarity between us and bats in our um, anatomy. Bats are mammals. They are the only mammal capable, capable of true flight. You can see their beautiful little wings are, if you took your pinky and just extended it down and put some skin between them, you would have a very similar bat wing. Um, yeah, I just love that, that uh, direct comparison there. Next slide, sir. Thank you. As I said, they're the only mammals capable mammals capable of true flight. Um, I love this picture on the right. Here's a mama eastern red bat with two baby twins. Um, you'll often see mamas flying around with their babies attached to or hanging on them. Um, it's the easiest way to transport them. You can actually see the the baby on the right is likely nursing from its mom. Um, beautiful, beautiful little babies. Uh, bats in the wild tend to live for, can live for about 20 years. Some have been found to live for over 40, um, especially in captivity, but even in the wild. And bats uh, give birth to typically one pup a year, though, like we see here, occasional twins. That information about that birth rate is going to be super important later when we talk about um, them being so threatened. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly a couple of things about um, the social uh culture of bats. Bats are extremely social animals, especially the ones we have here in the Northeast. A lot of them um, form what we call maternal colonies where the mama bats uh, raise all of their young together. And while certain moms are out and about flying, um, the other moms will take care of the babies. Also, baby bats have been found to have unique calls that work sort of like names so that their mamas can identify them in colonies of thousands of baby bats. Um, they can do their specific chirp and the mamas can find them. Um, bats have been found to have really complex uh, communication styles with one another. There's a lot of beautiful research scientists working on identifying um, the different ways that they communicate. Um, they've been known to squabble and complain with each other in close quarters and um, call each other out and coo at their babies, use specific voices to talk to their babies. So they're really um, very social animals. They're shy with human beings which is fine, but they're very social with one another um, and they have very complex uh, relationships and they're often found to form lifelong friendship bonds, um, which I think is really beautiful. They'll meet a bat out in the wild and then they'll choose to um, roost with them for the whole summer season and return to those same roosts together later. Uh, yeah, so bats are super abundant throughout the world. There's over 1400 species that have been identified here in the US. We have 45 species. And here in New York state, we have nine bat species. Um, all the bats here in New York state are insectivores, meaning they live off of and eat insects. Um, they use echolocation to hunt them down. I'm sure we've all heard people talk about uh, bats in relation to echolocation. I just wanna point out also that you may have heard this, the colloquial phrase, blind as a bat. Bats are not blind at all. They actually have pretty great, pretty excellent eyesight, but they do because they hunt and um, eat at night. They do rely on echolocation to find their food, but they still have very great working vision in addition to echolocation. So they've got even more resources than us to navigate around. So we, let's talk about bat habitats. Um, so there's different types of habitats that are important for different parts of bats' uh, annual life cycles, like life histories. So we have in the summertime when bats are active in our area, there are roosting habitats, forage habitats, and maternal roosts are the big areas of importance. And then in the winter, are the hibernacula, which is where some of the bats in our area will make use of uh, caves and abandoned mines and such to hibernate over the winter. So roosting habitats include trees, which are a very, very important part of bats' um, biology, and cavernous structures, which include 
um, things like bat houses, like purposeful art supplemental bat habitats, and also um, things like somebody's attic that there isn't too much too much action going on in for very long periods of time. Nice, quiet, warm um, places. Uh, that's why bats are sometimes found in places like people's attics because it's an opportunistic place, especially after a storm, uh, to to hang out and to to stay protected overnight or during the day until the next day when they can move on. And then forage habitats. Forage habitats are where bats a lot over overlap significantly with pollinator conservation uh, because bats essentially eat pollinators um, in addition to other insects. Uh, one of the big ones uh, that a lot of the higher flying bat species will eat as well as some of the lower flying ones will be moths. Uh, so bodies of water where um, moths and other insects like mosquitoes will make use of in, at night are super important. Uh, meadows, so meadows that have the nighttime blooming plants, white flower blossoms, fragrant flowers that attract pollinators in the evening, and canopy breaks. So areas of forest where there are breaks in the canopy that allow for the aggregation of a lot of these different animals to overlap. So if you've ever walked through the like walk through the woods and come to like a small little clearing and those are the places at night where you're likely to encounter uh bats as well as um the other insects that are going to be out there. Um maternal roosts. So bats have this very unique and very important thing that they do um, when it comes to raising their young. Um, ma uh, the mother bats, they practice site, what's called site fidelity, where they will identify a place that they know is a, a safe place that has food available to them and shelter for them uh, to make use of every season. And they will return to that site every single year. And they'll do it in groups. So like Roxanne said, that sometimes they'll make lifelong friends. That happens a lot with female bats. And they will collectively make use of the same space over and over and over. And this is like, we can start kind of like alluding to how uh, the importance of places like button hook in this, in this right, because of the if there are is that there is an established maternal colony there that's generational knowledge and that this group of bats will come back to there they'll leave for the winter where their young will be raised and their young will come back to that place with their mothers and the cycle like goes on and on and on so disrupting that cycle has like very significant consequences and then uh, hibernacula so caves and uh, abandoned mines etc this is where they'll go during the winter and they'll hibernate. And not all bats do do this, but most of the ones in New York do. And this is where they will slow down all of their body systems and they will go to sleep for the winter when there is no abundance of food and other resources. And they will hang tight and then come and wake up the next year when it starts to warm up and then head back out again. So trees, 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 trees. Trees are super important. Um, this diagram shows that there are five different types of trees that make up over 75% of the occupancy for bats in the Eastern United States. And those are uh, Quercus, which are oak trees, Pinus, which are pine trees, Acers, which are maple trees, Nyssa, which are tupelos, and caria, which are hickories. Just this five group of trees, more than three quarters of bats will occupy these trees, these, these types of trees specifically. 
they basically have like preferences and there are a lot of characteristics features that these trees have that create desirable spaces and that's the density of the foliage of pine trees the the cavernous qualities that oak trees have when they get older the um foliated bark features that some hickory trees have like the shag bark hickories things like that um other features including um, like shedding limbs uh, some trees lose limbs easier than others and those breaks in the the lower tree limbs create all these neat little cavernous places that bats can tuck themselves into during the daytime to stay safe from predators. So this list of trees is also on our website. If you're ever interested in planting trees specifically for bat conservation, we have some recommendations. And then this, these are some of the examples of how bats will make use of trees and where we start to see the two different groups of bats, uh, how they kind of behave with trees. So there's uh, cave bats and tree bats, essentially. Cave bats are the bats that will be hibernating. And tree bats are the type of bats that actually migrate south for the winter. So they'll fly down towards the, um, towards like the Gulf, down towards Texas, and into like the, that area of the country over the winter as opposed to hibernating. And then they'll return up here once the once the weather starts getting warmer, similarly to similarly to bird patterns. And because of those two dynamics, um, they interact with trees differently. So cave trees will make use of cavernous features of trees. Like on the left, there's uh, this northern long-eared bat is tucked into some bark that has become like. Uh, separated from the tree, some exfoliated bark, and tucked itself into there for safety. Whereas in the middle, we have the eastern red bat and the hoary bat, which are tree bats that will migrate south for the winter. They will kind of hang freely amongst the foliage and kind of, and uh, use the foliage to keep themselves protected from things like wind and uh, rain and predators. Um, I often say this in the, the bat walks that we do. If you're looking at pine trees, look at all the little pine cones because some of them actually might not be pine cones. They might be Eastern red bats, which are similar sized and similar shapes when they're all wrapped up. So as much as bats or trees are important to bats, trees are important to the the other wildlife that are related to bats. So those would be uh, pollinators, like the nighttime pollinators, like moths. So those same five groups of trees are also the host plants for, as you can see, more than a thousand different species of caterpillars. And so planting these trees and protecting these trees that already do exist um, has a significant impact on not just where bats can live because of the shelter that it provides, but also because of the food that these trees will generate by being the host plants for all these caterpillars that will turn into the moths that are one of the significant food sources for bats in our area. So again, like planting these types of trees um, as opposed to non-native and like horticultural specimens has a significant impact on the ecology and that specifically and then indirectly because of the ability to support all of their food sources. And a little bit more about caves, the spookier part of bat stuff. So in the northwest or in the northeast um, they'll hibernate in caves and abandoned mines. New York is actually uh, ripe with old abandoned mines. Um, there are some species of bats that over the winter in New York state, most of that entire species will come together in just one abandoned mine for the winter. And that highlights the significance of like protecting these spaces as well and making sure that they're not uh, disturbed by development or disturbed by 
um, excessive human um, contact uh, because it can have like a serious impact on disturbing hibernation when it's being made use of during the winter season. Um, the caves provide protection from predators and from the elements. So uh, oftentimes caves will have like narrow entryways, not, you know, the stereotypical like large cave entrance that you would imagine in like a cartoon or something. But a lot of caves have like smaller entry points and mines will have um, like escape routes that are smaller exit points. And that'll be how bats will come in and out. And those will protect them from any uh, uh, larger birds of prey from being able to get at them in the evening, specifically owls and then other mammals um, during the daytime that would be able to come and uh, uh, disturb them. <laughs> like um, skunks during the night, uh, but during the day, uh, things like coyotes, uh, bobcats during that transitional time period at like dusk or dawn rather, uh, when those predators start to come out and the bats are starting to go away, the, the caves will make use, um, the caves will provide protection from them. Uh, and again, not all bats will make use of the caves. There are three bat species in New York, the hoary bat, the eastern red bat, and the silver haired silver -haired. Silver -haired bat that will migrate south for the winter as opposed to staying here year round. So forage habitats. This is um, this is my favorite thing to talk about um, with most of our collaborative work actually is working in partnership with pollinator organizations on securing um, site locations and materials to, to donate and manpower to do restoration work because of the importance of pollinator habitats to bats. There's a significant overlap um, because, you know, bats are also like an indicator species. If you have bats, you probably also have pollinators. So like working to enhance those things to make both of them um, more robust is, um, is kind of like what we need in, in the world of conservation. And then I'm gonna give it back to Roxanne to talk about some of this stuff. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about, we've been telling you all about bats and all about where they live and how they live here, but we should talk about why they're so vital, why we need to protect them and why we should care so deeply. Not just because we should care about every animal, but what role specifically do bats play? So as I said earlier, <clears throat> all of our bats here in New York are insectivores. So they eat exclusively insects and they play a super vital role in insect population control. Um, just from an economic standpoint, my first bullet point there, bats save approximately $23 billion in agricultural losses in the United States alone. Um, bats eat a, a large variety of beetles that damage a lot of our agricultural crops. So in areas where bats are abundant, farmers are able to um, preserve many more crops without the use of pesticides. Um, than they are in areas where bats have become less abundant. They also um, protect from insects that spread diseases to humans, like the West Nile virus. Um, a lot of our bats eat a ton of, a ton, ton, ton of mosquitoes per night. I like to say that um, the little brown bat can eat over a thousand mosquitoes um, in one night, which is a really staggering number, um, which is great for protecting against diseases, but also just on a lifestyle level. Um, I know for me, the fewer mosquitoes I can have buzzing around my yard, the happier I'm going to be. So um, the presence of bats is super important in keeping those pest species at bay um, and making our lives just a lot more pleasant. Um, like I said before, protecting the bat population and bolstering the bat population can almost entirely replace the use of pesticides if we do it correctly, um, which has massive economic benefits, but also health benefits for um, animals and us human beings. Uh, we all know that the, the dangers that pesticides uh, can present. And so bats can really play a big role in helping us eliminate those. Next slide, please, sir. Thank you. 
Um, bats are also um, pollinator species. Not here in the Northeast. Um, our bats uh, aren't, we don't rely on bats for pollination, but on a larger global scale and in the um, Southern United States, bats are essential pollinators um, to night blooming plants. So bats have co-evolved with some a variety of night blooming plants so um, that they rely on them for nectar and food and as they fly about much like um, much like bees and other uh, insect pollinators they get the pollen on their little fur and spread it amongst the plants um, actually they are the sole pollinator of the wild agave plant that makes tequila um, which is a huge which like we love tequila but also it's a huge um economic uh, resource for the Southern US and Mexico and without bats, that plant would not exist. Yeah. Cool, so also in other parts of the world, bats eat fruit. They are fruitivorous and um, they are essential uh, seed dispersal and they're essential for um, reforestation. Bats actually are the first species that will come in and reforest um, deforested areas because they have such a wide range of flight paths. Um, they tend to be almost always the first species to come in and drop seeds with their poop and reforest areas. Um, their poop, their bat guano is also super essential to the nitrogen cycle, maintaining the nitrogen cycle of our planet. Um, it's an amazing fertilizer, not just for use of farmers, but just out in the wild. And, um, also I love that paleoclimatologists can use bat guano to monitor climate records, um, longer term than tree cores or glacier samples. Um, so ironically, yeah, their, their poop is essential to making this planet run and continue to run the way that it has for millions of years. So go go back, Guano. Um, we touched a little bit on this, but bats uh, are super abundant species. Like I said before, there's 1400 species of them worldwide and they comprise a fifth of the world's mammal species. Um, that level of biodiversity means that they play an integral role in, I mean, unfathomable amounts of um, ecosystems, uh, both by, you know, controlling um, different species of insects, also by being food sources themselves. Um, so without these many species of bats, our planet would not function the way that it does, and ecosystems would become horrifically imbalanced. Um, yeah, without bats and the services they provide, human, animal, and plant life would be severely negatively impacted because they are just such abundant and important species. Next slide, please. Oh, back to you, Ryan. So we can talk really, really quick about white nose syndrome and population uh, destruction or rather habitat destruction. And these are the two uh, main contributors to population decline and why bats are in need of intervention from, from people. Uh, so white nose syndrome is a relatively, uh, I think, featured uh, wildlife disease. I think it's talked about pretty regularly, but if you are unfamiliar with it, uh, this image at the bottom is, is what it looks like. It's a fungal disease that's caused by Pseudogymnoascus destructans, which is a, uh, a fungus from Eastern Europe that has, since its introduction in the mid-2000s, has killed millions of species of bats or millions of individuals of bats, with some bat species specifically being impacted significantly more than others um, by losing up to and exceeding 90% of their population. The little brown bat in the United States is one of those bats. Um, most of the bats in the United States that are uh, have rapidly become uh, part of the, have approached the listing of endangerment is because of white nose syndrome. Um, infected bats, when they, when bats go into hibernation, so bats are mammals like us, and we don't 
get fungal infections without being immunocompromised. And that has to do with our body temperature. Because our body temperature is so high, 98.6 degrees, um, it is not a hospitable environment for funguses to thrive. However, bats hibernate. And during hibernation, to lower their metabolism and to reduce the amount of energy that they consume for the duration of the winter, their body temperature goes down. So they become susceptible to fungal infections. So white nose syndrome, uh, this fungus came over here from Eastern Europe, most likely because of ecotourism from, from cave spelunking, that it got into, the spores got into the fabric materials of cave exploring and cave um, climbing and was brought here, specifically in New York State, is where it was first identified in upstate New York or in the Hudson Valley. Um, and that was in the early 2000s, around like 2005, 2008, uh, depending on who you ask. And since then, it's gotten uh, widespread. It's in 38 states. Um, we'll get to we'll get to that in a second. Um, but my own, uh, let's see. There we go. I had to move everybody out of the way so I could see what I'm looking at. Um, so managing white nose syndrome. Um, it's been unsuccessful, unsuccessfully eradicated uh, because because white nose syndrome disturbs their bats hibernation, uh, they end up starving to death in the winter and because there's no food sources available. Uh, in order to actively treat white nose syndrome, you would have to disturb the bats hibernation. So like the effective treatment is, is like kind of doing the same thing. Um, by disturbing their their hibernation when there's no way for them to start to sustain themselves again there's very limited food sources around so the best avenue to helping bats that are affected by white nose syndrome is by protecting their habitats specifically where they are staying in the winter and where they are going in the summertime and where they are eating in the summertime so again, like alluding to the importance of places like Buttonhook and how protecting these places is super important for rebounding populations. So this slide is uh, shows where in the Hudson Valley in New York, uh, Pseudogymnoascus disruptions was first identified in, 2000. this says 2007, depending on who you ask, there's like a little bit of fluctuation on who identified it first and when. Um, but this is where it was identified. And then in 2022, this is where it has spread to. So it is in Canada and all the way out to the West Coast in Seattle. I think Oregon this year reported um, reported its first positive identification of the fungus in caves. And then in Arizona, conversations that we've had with uh, Arizona Fish and Wildlife, they are preparing for it to show up there. There are some pretty important caves uh, down there near uh, Tucson that they're they're getting ready for it to come and they've they've started implementing um, cave decontamination procedures for visitors to make sure that nobody is bringing any of the spores in and they have like a very rigid uh, cleaning process when the maternal colonies are not present in the cave, they will survey the cave to see if the fungus is there and decontaminate it. Luckily, they haven't found it yet, but they're still doing like uh, decontaminations because believe it or not, pocket lint from people going into their pockets and it dropping onto the ground is weirdly enough, a significant nutrient source for fungus because it contains skin cells. And so something as simple as thousands of people a year coming into a cave and like dropping lint from their pockets onto the ground, if the fungus was to get into there, uh, it would have a significant food source to flourish. And then habitat destruction. Um, again, 
Here's another image of another bat species, the hoary bat with its twins. And this mom has them kind of like tucked into her as they're uh, probably hiding from the cameraman. <laughs> That's probably what's happening. Um, but so the expansion of human activity, specifically with housing and agriculture, have uh, destroyed or fragmented and degraded bat environments. So specifically like situations like what's going on with, with Buddenhook Forest, um, about a place like that forest being uh, impacted by leveling certain parts of it to put in uh, concrete and to put in buildings, removing all of that habitat. Um, that is an, the illustration of the issue of that habitat destruction. Even if it's not entirely clear cut, when you have that significant, that significant of a disturbance, all of that generational knowledge ends up gone. So all of the generations of bats that come back to that space to raise their young every single year, of which um, it is likely that that's what's happening there, um, they'll come back one year and it won't be there anymore. And then you have thousands of bats that, what do I do? Where do I go? And it'll break up that population and they'll all have to go someplace else, uh, not together and uh, limit a lot of the protection that they have in numbers and a lot of the opportunities for reproduction and um, try and find amongst the developing, you know, New York, uh, suburbs, other places to go, which is challenging because Buttonhook is not alone in the the fight that they're fighting on preserving preserving green spaces. Cool. So we're gonna kind of try to whip through this because we have a little bit left to talk about. I know we're running out of time, but um, I just really quickly want to say on an individual level some of the things that we can do as individuals outside of this beautiful fight for button hunt. Um, we can support their habitat, which falls under this fight for these areas, but also on an individual level, you know, if you have tr trees on your property, um, anything you can do to try to protect those trees. Also, um, things like fallen leaves, fallen tree branches, leaving those uh, whenever possible, whenever it's safe for humans, that provides essential habitat. Um, you can also supplement with bat houses. We have, we're not going to talk super in depth about bat houses right now, but on our website, you can find a full page on those with all the details about correct bat house builds and where to hang them, et cetera. Um, we also have a guide on our website about gardening for bats. So plants that, um, that attract native, uh, bugs, that therefore attract bats um, and help bolster their uh, environment. Um, getting rid of pesticides whenever possible um, benefits the bats and then allows us to um, have more bats, which then gets rid of pesticides on a larger scale. Um, also, much like a lot of bird species, bats can be impacted negatively by leaving lights on um, and well-lit areas. So if we can turn the lights out at night, um, that's super helpful. And then another huge thing, probably one of the most important things we can do is to talk to people about bats and their importance. They're very maligned animals. And um, the more people know what an essential role they play in maintaining our ecosystem and our planet, um, the better. All right, back to Buttonhook, the reason back we're all hook, here yeah. today. So Buttonhook is, uh... Because, of, because it's an old growth forest in a, in a, a metropolitan area and because of its size and tree composition being mostly native trees, it is a very, very important place. Um, bats, I've listened to thousands of bat recordings from Buttonhook Forest and there are a plethora of endangered species that are there and the abundance of species and the abundance of individuals. There's a lot of bats there, basically. <laughs> and in addition to it being a place where bats are active during the year, um, bats 
will they need to travel so they'll either move further north or potentially stand but in button hook in a cave there potentially um to hibernate for winter or fly south for the winter and that's migrate along riparian corridors which are along rivers um, because of the clear flight path, path that it has and the food sources along the way so the Bunhook Forest is also in the um, Hudson River watershed. So bats move on this, along this corridor to get further north for hibernation. It's like towards the Adirondacks and further south. Um, so it's really, really important as a, a long-term roosting location and as a short-term place where bats will stop for a day or two while they refuel and then continue their journey either north or south. Um, after listening to all of the bat calls and the, the, the abundance of them in some areas, um, I, I think that it's, it's most likely that uh, Buttonhook is also one of these maternal sites because of its size because of the old growth, um, the the age of the trees that are there, the feature like uh, the the cave being present there, and that it's not disturbed, um, makes it a highly desirable place for a maternal colony to have been established. And because it's been there for so long, it probably already has been. In order to like support that with evidence things like mist netting and tagging of species would have to happen to see if those same female bats are returning there year and year. Um, so that's something that would have to happen to like prove that, but it is, it is most likely a maternal site because of all of those factors, which um, highlights the importance of the area and has like a, indicates the path of what like additional research can be done there to show the the significance of specifically Buttonhook and places like it in a an urban area like the New York City metropolitan area. There is I say this all the time. Um, in a place like the New York City metropolitan area, the amount of spaces like this are so few and far between, and keeping keeping the like wilded and natural areas above and below the city of New York connected is super important so that bats will continue to like pass through and make use of this space and because of white nose syndrome and because of like because of habitat destruction keeping those numbers present keeping those bats present and then helping them to increase is super important and one of the best ways to do that is to protect a place like Bunhook Forest because of all of the things that it provides for bats specifically and much, much more than that. But we're here talking about bats today. But um, I th think that's our whole presentation. <laughs> we did go over, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm a chatterbox. I can't help myself. <laughs> and um. But I'm, we're super excited to like have questions and to like continue talking. We don't have like a super hard stop time. So we can definitely chat about bats if anybody has any questions, uh, comments, concerns, all that fun stuff. Um, thank you everybody for being here. This was fun. And um, yeah, I'm excited to talk more about people who want to know more stuff about bats. <laughs> wow, that was absolutely amazing so <laughs> thank you and we're so glad you went over we'd love to be with you for like you know the next 24 hours talking about this but really everything the two of you covered was totally like on spot and exactly what we were hoping that you would share and the insights and wow that was such an amazing learning so again thank you for all your work thank you for sharing all of that knowledge with us and all of those great suggestions and i want to just be sensitive to the folks who are joining us today um, so if anyone would like to ask questions, um, I would say, I don't think anyone is muted right now. Um, uh, maybe can you raise your hands if you have a question? Who do we see who has their hand up? Oh. Dennis and Lori, I saw, sorry. 
Okay, great. Excellent. Dennis, greetings, Dennis. Thank you for Hello. joining us. Just a, just a bio geek question. Your habitat destruction slide, is, is that a Norway spruce that the bats were nestled on? Because it sure looked it. I was just curious. I'm going to send that one to Ryan. <laughs> I'll have to go back and like find that slide. I think it was, oh, okay. Um, I mean, potentially, I can't, me personally, I can't tell just from this image. So I can't tell you with confidence with what, what particular ask, tree that is. We can ask our tree specialist. And, okay, and, and then know. that leads to the, to the second question, because I know you threw up the maples generically. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's this constant friction, you know, tree of heaven, Norway maple, you know, so that's when it sits as an individual, but are you potentially advancing? And I just need to know this because not, nothing's easy. Are you potentially advancing that if you do have a forested community, even if it's been obviously historically cleared, you know, historically meaning none of us were even an apple in anybody's eye. And, you know, now has had a chance to sort of regrow, even though the composition may not be uh, from a quality perspective in terms of judging the forest in another set of criteria, if, if they're of size and or, you know, there is a composition of Norway maples that does that become like reduced in its factor? Because, you know, the bat, certain bats could still take advantage uh, of that species or is it preferable to have the silvers, the reds, the sugars, et cetera? It, one of the things that we focus on in like evaluating spaces is like the, the overstory composition of like natives versus invasives and like in a place because of like, for all of the reasons of like why it's challenging to fully like clear and remove invasives and everything, um, a percentage of them existing in a space isn't necessarily the most destructive thing in the world, um, unless it becomes like to, uh, to like, unless they outcompete like the natives as like time goes on, but one of the things that we do do with like volunteer groups and stuff is native um, invasive species removal. So like digging out tree of heaven, um, uh, digging out uh, like uh, calorie pears and stuff like that and putting in their place uh, native trees. So it depends on like the, the extent in the city, it's like a lot more invasive species removal because we have so many more like horticultural specimens that like went crazy here um so I don't know if that answers your question but like it's a part of like how we evaluate the like overall integrity of like a habitat and like the the strategy for like conservation the 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 suggestions that we make um usually include removing invasive species because there are so many of them in like the New York area um so like it to 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 ebb things in the direction of it being like a majority native and the 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 specific species of those trees doesn't necessarily matter um it's like it is just as broad as the genera that just having like any of the maples that are native any of the uh, oaks that are native are is going to be beneficial and will provide all of the habitat and forage for bats Okay. And yeah, I agree. Polling tends to work better uh, in terms of nobody's going to react to that. It's the, the the bigger ones that have made it. And then when the chainsaws fire up, I think that that's where, it, you know, at least around here, it kind of becomes the, well, but it's this big, but it's, you know, so, and these are, it's valid. I was just curious how you guys went through it. Thank you. Yeah. And I want to just give a quick shout out. Dennis is the Newcastle Environmental Coordinator. We're very fortunate to have him working with our town. So thank you for asking those really re relevant, pragmatic questions, Dennis. And I'm sure, Ryan, are you available? Are you and Roxanne available if Dennis ever has any follow-up questions? Oh, totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We'll drop, I'll drop out Ryan's email in the, in the chat, so. Great. Okay. Thank you for those great questions, Dennis. Okay. And next I see Lucille Rossi has a question. 
Yes. Um, I just this. Yep. This is just a silly question. I know I, I'm not saying that I'm concerned, but can you talk about rabies? I can yeah, talk about rabies. Absolutely. <laughs> it's okay. not it's not a silly question at yeah, all. It's, it's not a silly question important. because it's rabies is a very serious disease. It has a 100% mortality rate. Like you can't survive from getting rabies. Um that being said, the so like it is a very serious thing and has like very significant consequences. However, the all of the progress that we've made in rabies um, prevention has created a new world. So it's very different than the 50s where like 50% of like dogs like had rabies and strays. It was like a very, very common thing. Um, now it's like much, much less than that. I think it's with canines specifically, I think it's like 3% of canines that are like strays have been found to have rabies. With that specifically, um, in North America, Canada, and the United States, the average occurrence of rabies transmission to humans uh, is between one and two every single year. So the amount of times that this happens is very, very, very minimal. And globally, the number of uh, the amount of rabies transmissions from animals to humans is 90% from canines. So canines are like the main uh, transmitter from, of rabies from animals to humans. And it's most likely because stray dogs interact with animals like skunks and raccoons and, and bats, like the big rabies vector species. Um, but in our part of the world, with all of the systems that we have in place, all of those numbers have been like very greatly reduced. So to answer your question, like bats are a rabies vector species. They're a, they are a vector for a lot of different diseases because most likely, sorry, I live in the city and there's sirens everywhere. Um, because, um, Oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, they're 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 a disease vector species because of right have... because they most likely have this super unique characteristic of being mammals that can fly. Their metabolism is likely very very different than other mammals. So bats will will acquire diseases that won't kill them. Rabies <laughs> does kill bats, but at large. Um, the amount of like rabies transmissions amongst bats is very low. So we're not seeing any sort of like significant population issues with rabies. Um, so bats do have, are one of the rabies vector species, but the the occurrence of, of rabies transmissions from bats to people is so, is so, so low. And honestly, a lot of the language that's used and how like this is presented is misleading um, to me. I, that... I want to say I want to say really quickly. Ryan said that in all the U.S. and Canada, there's one to two rabies species a year transmitted from animals to humans. I just want to say that that's not specifically from bats. That's from oh yeah, that's just rabies. At every large from rabies anything. at large is just one. The average of one to two people in the entire continental. Uh, north america a year not just from bats from all species from, from, from everything yeah. yeah so it's 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 something that like should be um like wary of it like when we're discussing with people like when you find injured bats or if there are bats that are like grounded around you that you should never interact with a bat like directly because the best way to not ever get rabies from any wildlife is to not touch it and not provide the opportunity for transmission. You, you can't get rabies from a bat like flying past you. You can only get it from its saliva um, if it pierces your skin and gets into your bloodstream. That's the only way that it can be transmitted. So if if one like flies past you or if it like cuts you, like there are things, there are all these systems that we have in place to like handle those, um, handle that scenario. Um, but the likelihood that a person is going to get rabies from bats just being present in the environment is is so so low 
I hope that answers you. your question. Yeah, thank you, Lucille, for that. It's part. It's actually perfect because you know you see these kind of questions all the time in the public, and also um, you know what one or two rabies. I mean, it's it's just so, it's so devastating, I guess. But um, people are afraid of it, so you know, knowledge can ease some of that. Yeah. Fear. So I appreciate yeah. the Absolutely. answer. So that's Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. less likely to be hit by uh, a bolt of lightning. Yeah, you're more likely it's to have it's so true. many things happen. Yeah, it also occurs. It also occurs more abundantly in other species that we interact with all the time, like raccoons, etc. So, mm -hmm. um, the pointed fear at bats specifically is, in our opinion, pretty overblown. And um, I think you would be incredibly aware if you were bit by a bat, um, and then you would, you know, take the proper steps to protect yourself against rabies. Okay. Thank you so much for that great response. Great question. Great response and putting it in perspective for us. And then let's take another question from Chris Novell, please. If you'd unmute yourself. That would be great. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, the uh, three uh, things to mention and then a question. Um, when I had my uh, chimney cleaned to my boiler I think that was how a bat got into my house so I'll mention that you know was something to be aware of <coughs> excuse me um, and from years ago a woman told me that she got bitten by a bat and the way it happened is that she had a, a bag of clothespins you know old-fashioned wooden clothespins outside she reached in to get a clothespin and that's how she the bat found her finger um and i do a fair amount of uh, drying my laundry outside and so as far as you know the shape of garments i make it a point to bring the laundry in before it gets dark so that you know, the likelihood of uh, a bat uh, finding its way into a sleeve or a pocket is, you know, not likely. So just uh, tell me if I'm, I'm thinking thoughtfully <laughs> in that way. I, you know, I'm doing the good uh, ecological thing to dry the laundry naturally. Um, but again, to be cautious for the other possible situation. Um, and then the question I would have, of course, it would be wonderful for us to be sharing the knowledge you just shared with us. And since you've been recording it, will we automatically be getting the recording having registered? And then uh, can we share the recording with other people? Yes, yes, absolutely. You, we will send out the recording to everyone and we're gonna be widely sharing the recording on the various Facebook pages of all our co-sponsors and other pages as well. So please share. The goal is to get this information out to as many people as possible. Great. Thank you and so, so much. To to just like quick note about um, what you were saying with the, the, the clothes and laundry outside. Um, a lot of bat activity in the later part of the year is all of the babies that were born earlier in the summer are learning to fly um, before they'll either migrate north or south for the winter. And that like this time of year specifically is when we see a lot of, a lot more bats out and about with like injuries, um, getting into places that they probably shouldn't be. And it is, because we have a lot of juveniles that are learning to fly for the first time uh, for like significant distances, making big um, movements. So like the clumsiness of a juvenile bat, like finding like hanging laundry um, makes sense that like that might happen um, and like end up getting disoriented and falling into something near nearby um, that does make sense to me that that might happen um, until they start to learn the behavior of like um, how to use like echolocation better and seeing those like big structures uh, at night with with like their sounds um, but it I guess like to to, to comment on that um, 
hanging like laundry and stuff outside at night um during that time period where like if there are a lot of bats where you're hanging your like laundry because you live up against a forest with a lot of bats this might be the time of year that at night those types of things might be more likely to happen like will they happen all the time probably not but if it was to happen it would probably be like in that time period where there's a lot of bats moving at the same time and a big percentage of them are juveniles uh uh, thank you, uh, Ryan. Uh, one more thing. Uh, when I did have that bat in my house, um, I went to sleep. I closed the bedroom door and put a towel at the bottom. And then the next morning, um, thinking, gee, it's probably still around here. And suddenly it was flying. It, you know, got up and it was flying. So at that time, uh, the Bedford Hills Police would receive the bats and i knew the technique and maybe you want to go over this um of you know getting a can and sliding a piece of cardboard uh basically i was able to capture the bat and take it to the police station yeah it's um we actually helped somebody not too long ago in yonkers where a bat got into the basement of an apartment building um, because it came in through the the doorway in the basement that leads out to where the trash goes it had rained that night so it was likely just like scooted in um but that's like basically what we did was advising them to like use put stuff over your hands just to like keep your hands protected and then use like a shoe box or something just kind of scoop it up and then put it back outside if there's any like significant injury or or anything like that, or trying to figure out where to bring it. Um, there's a really, really good website uh, called animalhelpnow.org where you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you all of the places in your area that are close to you that will accept that specific type of animal. And um, it'll show you the list of ones that are open and that you can contact or close that if you have time to wait, you can contact the next day. It's a really, really good website. That is uh really and, and you're putting that in the chat, please. Sure. Um, and I just want to so I just want to emphasize really quick. Sorry, again, um, please, please, please. Ryan said it quickly, but I, I need to I want to emphasize it again. Please, please, please. You need to be covering any uh, exposed skin if you're going to deal with a bat. Please protect yourself. So yeah. Gloves. Great. Thank gloves, you. Gloves, sleeves. So now the way that I Chris, I just want to sensitive to making sure that we get to other folks. So these are wonderful questions and we are welcome to ask your next question. I just want to be sensitive to moving on soon. Thank okay. you. Okay. So based on everything that has been mentioned, should I have tried to just capture the bat and release it outside instead of taking it? Um, if, if there's no visible injuries, oftentimes the best thing to do is nothing except for like get it out of the space that like you're occupying. So if it's if it was flying, there's probably nothing wrong with it. And just getting it out of your living space would be the priority. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. That's really you. so helpful. So helpful. And just one quick follow-up to that. I'm wondering what I've heard before from rehabbers is when you are setting free a bat and obviously to protect yourself, as you've been saying, is it important to put them at the base of a tree or somewhere that they can climb up as opposed to just onto the ground? Yeah. So bats can't, bats cannot take flight from the ground. They have to be hanging from something and drop into flight. Um, so yeah, your best bet with uh, helping a, a bat is to put them at the base of a tree, um, that, which they'll then use their little thumb claws and their back feet to climb up and then they'll be able to take flight from there. It also allows them to climb up and protect themselves from any mammals on the ground or uh, predators on the ground. Um, so yeah, the base of a tree is, is really ideal. Where y'all live, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for that. Um, so you're set up for uh, good good spots to release a bat. It also safety. minimizes the um, interaction. So like if you were to use something like a like a cardboard box, which I suggest, um, you can then just kind of use the box to like place them at the base of a tree rather than trying to get them to fly. It's it's a lot safer to just place them at the base Absolutely. of a tree so that the the interaction is minimalized directly. 
Okay, great. This is so helpful. Thank you both. Excellent information. Paula, do you have a question? Can you unmute yourself, please? Fortunately, Chris handled part of my question. I'm currently in an apartment in Lenox, Massachusetts, although I'm moving back to Orange County, New York. And I had a bat suddenly appear in a screened balcony and it had a broken wing. And to my despair, I could not find anyone to help. And I left the door open. I opened the door and left it open until it was nighttime and then closed it and had to console myself that at least it was not going to be tortured by another animal. Um, I also kept my cat out of the balcony. Um, so the information of the animal help.org is very, very helpful. Is there something I should have been doing to um, decontaminate the, the balcony or anything? Because my cat spends a lot of time out there. Yeah, no, you're, I think you you should be, um, you should be fine um, as far as decontamination goes. Any of the things we talked about, like white nose syndrome and stuff, they, they can't affect um, a, uh, a, they specifically affect animals in hibernation with those slow down metabolisms. So your cat will not be affected by that. Um, and, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, but um, absolutely, we want to minimize their interaction for both animal safety. So you did the right thing in, in keeping that away. I'm so sorry that happened. That's such a disheartening situation to be in. And um, thank you for doing everything you could for the animal. And yeah, a website like that is going to be your best bet. Unfortunately, there aren't, there part of what we want to do in this, in our mission is to expand that network of people who can't take bats. And unfortunately it is sparse in some areas. Um, it's just an un unfortunate reality, but yeah, your best bet is to look at a website like that with a good directory. Right. And thank you, Paul. Again, the name of the group is Animal Help Now, just if you want to write it down. Oh, thank you. Excellent. I'm going to call on Tracy Bilski, who's one of the leaders of Friends of Buttonhook. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan and Roxanne. Amazing presentation. Ryan, you mentioned next steps for being able to determine um, what type of bat species are present. You mentioned misnetting and tagging. Can you speak a little bit about acoustic recordings and what they're able to tell you and um, you know what you're able to learn from them? And if you would even share, um, having listened to some acoustic recordings from the perimeter of Buttonhook, what you actually found? Yes. So... Acoustic monitoring is um, recording of the the high frequency sounds that bats make in, all right, so I'm gonna step it back really fast. Um, so bats emit this really, really high frequency sound that we can't hear. And similar to, to whales um, they, they, and dolphins, they do it where they'll make like clicking sounds that will reflect off objects and will vibrate their like jaw bones that makes them be able to hear around them or visualize around them with sound. Bats are similar, but when they, they put out these high frequency sounds that reflect back and they, they actually hear it, they can hear those, those sounds. Um, one of the interesting things really, really fast about bats and like echolocation is that bats and moths are in this like epic evolutionary battle of, of sound. Moths at night are furry, whereas like butterflies, which are the same group of animals during the daytime, they don't have any fur. Moths at night have fur specifically because bats hunt them using sound and the fur dampens the, the sound and like the reflectivity of the sounds, um, just like a fun little nerdy thing. Um, so some bats have evolved bigger ears, like the northern long-eared bat, in like response to that evolution. Um, and there's a lot of differentiation between the frequencies that bats emit, and that's how you can tell them apart. So each one of the the species of bats will put out calls within like a certain frequency. 
and all of them are above what we can hear. So the technology that we have, um, basically in, in real time, which is really fun, um, will monitor for these high frequency noises. And then when it picks them up, it will slow them down and pitch them down to an audible, uh, audible sounds that while we're walking around in the woods at night, we'll be able to hear and see. Um, so it'll start on like the spectrograph, which is like a visual representation of the sound. It'll start lighting up and you can see the sounds happening and you can hear them and you can kind of start scanning around and you can start to see where they are. Um, so after we collect all of those recordings, um, we can run them through a software that will evaluate all the specific data points of the call, like the the high point of the frequency, the low point of the frequency, where the intense, the most intense point of the frequency is, the duration of the call, all these like various things that are unique specifically to each individual species. And it compares them to catalogs of um, po positively identified calls and will give you the, the likelihood and the confidence level of the identification of that call uh, and basically give you what, what that species it is. And then in addition to that, um, for like quality control, we then look at them manually and go through it manually. And particularly with um, endangered species, just to like double and triple check to make sure that what we're hearing is in fact what we're hearing. Um, and we'll manually like measure all of the things about the frequency. So make sure that the, the high point of the frequency is in the correct range for that species that it's making a claim of, the low frequency, et cetera. And just double check the, the software to make sure that it is, it is correct. So it's kind of a process. Um, the the fun part happens at night when we like get to listen to everything and like see it all happening in real time and then sitting down at the computer and just kind of going through um a lot of recorded sounds and making sure that like the software ID is accurate and for the most part it it is very accurate certain certain bats are similar um but after doing it for like a while you even just like in one session, especially when there's a lot of the repeated species that are there, it's very like while you're going through it, you could like, this is a big brown bat, this is a big brown bat, this is a hoary bat, this is a hoary bat, this is northern long-eared bat. Um, so that's based, that's kind of what that looks like. And it's, um, it is the preferred method of identifying bats because it's not invasive. Um, you don't need any sort of special um, permitting to do it. You don't need any sort of, uh, direct interaction. So it's, it's the safest, it's the least, um, time and cost in investment. Um, however, it is limited. So specifically with what we were talking about, about, uh, following up on the idea of whether or not an area is a maternal colony. And if it's being revisited by the same groups of females every year, that would involve mist netting, which is, basically like a very, very fine net that won't reflect sound is hung between trees so that bats won't like avoid it. They'll, they'll fly into it. And it, it looks a lot, it looks worse than it is because the idea of it sounds worse than it is because it's basically catching bats in nets. Um, but uh, they don't, they don't get hurt. Um, the material is like, uh, is like fish line material. So it doesn't like cause any like lacerations or anything like that. And then adding tags uh, around their uh, feet, um, like similar to bird tagging, they're like little cuffs that would go around their, their feet. Um, you would put that on there and do that process annually in, in, a, in the same place to see if you're seeing any of the repeat um, individuals coming back to the same area. Uh, you could also then do population studies that way too to see how many of that species is coming back into that area and estimate like the total number of them that are present in the whole 
um, like space that you're measuring. So like in button hook, you'd be able to do some fun statistics and like come up with a good guess of how how many of that species of bats are, are there and whether um, the same groups of females are returning or not. Ryan, can you touch back on really quickly um, some of the exciting species that you were able to identify at button hooks itself? Yes, I'm just gonna like pull up my, I hope I can find it. Mm, I don't think I'll find it fast enough, but we did, I was gonna try and play a recording really fast, but I don't think it's gonna work out. <laughs> um, so we we did identify uh, Indiana bats there, which is an endangered species, uh, federally protected, um, state protected. Uh, we did find tricolor bats, which are proposed. Um, so they are proposed endangered is their current status, which means they're at like that step that's right before being listed as an endangered species, which grants all of the protections. So right now it's not protected, but it is in the process of being decided upon and most likely will become protected. There is also uh, the little brown bat, which we talked about earlier, who is, it's the species that used to be the most abundant in all of North America and is now, uh, the population has declined by more than 90%. I think it's actually more than 95%. Um, and so they're in the process as well. They're proposed. So the process of, in, of listing them and protecting them has started too. So seeing all of these, I believe we also saw a Northern long-eared bat or we, list, we heard a Northern long-eared bat there as well, which um, was just added to the endangered species list officially at the end of March of this year. Interestingly enough, side note, um, the federal protection of bats is a very contentious thing right now um, in politics. There is, uh, there was actively a um, Congressional Review Act to uh, exempt them from being protected by the Endangered Species Act, specifically the Northern Long-Eared Bat, which was just vetoed, I wanna say two weeks ago by the president to maintain their protection status. So um, just like as a side note of things that are going on in the bat universe, um, but we identified basically all, all of the species of bat except for one were positively identified in Buttonhook Forest. And the one that was not identified was the small footed, uh, yeah, the small footed bat. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> it's just incredibly informative. Um, so thank you for explaining that whole process and especially what you found at Buttonhook. That's just amazing. So let me just continue to move on. We have thank you for that great question, Tracy. Um, we have a question from Lori. Lori, would you like to chime in with your question and unmute? Yourself? Can you hear me? Because oh, yes. good. Yes. Last time I was on Zoom, the, the audio didn't work. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing Doug Tallamy on Saturday night. And I was just wondering if there's room for collaboration between his project, the Homegrown National Park. He's encouraging people to plant those five trees you listed, he would call keystone species because they um, support so many species. Um, and I was just thinking it would be amazing if the, these groups could, you know, if more of us could collaborate. Um, I don't know if he's open to it or if you are, but it was a thought. And the other one, do you know about the New York Nut Growers Association? I've never gotten to one of their conferences, but, and I don't know if they'd be open for you doing a presentation, but I think it would be so amazing. They get together and they share scions. Um, I have a thing for shag bar kickery nuts. <laughs> I love them and I'm very, um, I'm a supporter of going back to local food that's here instead of shipping it around the world. But I have hesitations now since I know that it supports the wildlife. How much do you take for the humans and how much do you leave for them? Most of the shag barks I've seen, I'm always looking for them, are in decline. They're in areas that are very crowded. I have one friend with a farm, hers is magnificent. I actually have some nuts here right now 
And I was wondering, because I know the people who do primitive survival skills, they would always be planting acorns or shag barks. And I don't know if you know anyone, or I was going to try to reach out to some other people to see if they would take some of the nuts that I collected a few weeks ago and see if we can put them somewhere or I can learn where to put them and how. Anyway, I think I had multiple questions for which I apologize because I have oh, so much great. going through my head. And <laughs> don't I thank apologize. Both of you. Yeah. It's just don't apologize. amazing. Mm -hmm. There's um there's the three things jump really quickly to mind. The first is we are always looking to like get collaborative and plug in with other organizations that are doing working in in the same direction that we are. Um, like the best way to conserve uh, any wildlife is by making friends and uh, like amplifying what the work that you do. So uh, we're I'm definitely uh, interested in 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 those kinds of connections and seeing about how and when we can we can do things together for sure. Um, the second thing that jumped out really fast was with the the native plants and seeds and stuff. Um, there are I know in the, I know where we are in the city, and I imagine that they also exist elsewhere. Um, the The city has its own nursery of native plants in Staten Island, and they accept native seeds. Um, so that could be um, a good place to to start um, as by looking for like native seed banks to provide things like those. I know that the city in particular is um, very desperate for things like um, like shag bark hickories. Uh, they're not very easy to come by as far as like a nursery um, in order mm -hmm. to buy them. So that's why this place actually even exists in the first place um, to be able to uh, supply materials to the city's own like restoration initiatives. So I think that that's like a really great place to start looking for what to do because I do I do know that um, the the city and a lot of those friends of groups and conservancy groups that works in that work in parks are also trying to um, start native seed banks of their own as well. I know Riverside Park in on the Upper West Side they also have a native seed bank that they are constantly like people who go out foraging and find cool stuff, they'll they'll take them and speciate them and ID them and then add them to their seed bank for use in projects like that for sure. And is there, to, to that great question that Lori asked, is there um, a sense on an ethical level of how much something like shagbark hickory should be left and how much should be taken? Yeah, there's, I, 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 I don't know a lot about foraging, but I do know that there is like foraging etiquette and that I follow a lot of people on social media who are foragers and I know that there is etiquette. What exactly it is, I'm not, I can't speak to you, but I know that there is um, in that vein, like a, a method behind, you know, if you find this much, it's appropriate to take this much and leave this much behind. Um, I know that, that that is something out there on like an individual level. Um, when getting into things like permaculture of like pur purposefully like planting um, like fruit and nut trees and stuff like that, um, I don't know, um, but I imagine that those similar type of etiquettes apply about what is the sustainable yield of like what I can take for myself versus what I should leave behind. Um, so I'm not 100% sure, but I do know that there are people out there that operate in that world of like permaculture and foraging um, that know a lot more about like that specific practice of how much to leave behind. Can I, can I just quickly interject? Um, so even just to stay out of the woods, I mean, here in the burbs, I would say that all the um, hickory and or oak nuts that are otherwise being driven over because everybody's blown them to the end of the driveway and the side of the road, I would say you're probably safe to take a shovel and grab every one of those. And either if you want to plant them or I just encourage kids, I mean, you don't have to make it that complicated because, you know, there are no landscaping services amongst our fauna. They just, who eats, who drops, who this, who that. So I just encourage people for their own, on their own properties, which are otherwise, you know, maintain lawn, collect them, go somewhere and just go throw them. 
like, you know, go throw them in a wooded hillside, go throw, go throw them wherever you're going to throw them. And, you know, even if they don't propagate and grow, something else will at least benefit, you know, to potentially eat it as opposed to like fighting the wind tunnel of the leaf blower, you know, to try to actually go get that acorn. So, so it doesn't have to be that complicated. I, I just, you know, cause I agree the foraging thing can get, you know, you, 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 there is an ethicalness to that, but it's already lost once it's on the pavement and it's going to be just swept up by the street sweeper. So that's why I bring that up. Sorry to interject, but I just had to, it was a perfect no. opportunity. And Doug yeah, Talley really mentioned good. that because part of what he planted on his own property, he got that way. Ryan, do you know one of the things we started doing is making shag bark hickory tea? And I thought because it peeled, it was okay to take it. Not that we ever took a lot, a piece. But now that I know the insects and bats use those spots, I'm more hesitant to do it. Now, do you know, I mean, really, I take one small piece, but would I do it from the bottom? Do you know at what level the bats would roost on that? Yeah, um, bats are going to make, uh, they're going to avoid predators. So basically, if you can reach it, it's not an area that a bat's going to be. So if you're like okay. at ground level and, and picking off of it, it's it's right. not, not it's not going to be a place that's, uh, they'll be usually like 15 feet or higher is kind of like where the bats will, will try and roost. But I usually take it from what's already fallen, so. Okay, thank so you great. so much. Such a great question, great answer. And Dennis, brilliant idea. Maybe we could put that in our town e-newsletter, what you're suggesting. It's really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to move on as now. And speaking of social media, Stacey Morgan has a question. You might recognize her name because she handles all the Friends of Buttonhook Forest social media. So yes, Stacey. I know. I just, I just wanted to say, uh, both of you, thank you so much. This was such an informative um, uh, talk. Um, on that note, with, you know, sort of planting these trees that the city needs and also us, I mean, button hook forest would be perfect for that just to gather. I mean, it's pesticide free area. Um, we can even just gather and do a, a little nursery that we can sort of partner with the city and other uh, towns uh, like Yonkers and so on um, to also help with um, the bat population. Um, and the other note I wanted to find out with the white nose um, syndrome, that fungus, has it been um, sort of uh, perpetuated and made worse because of the climate crisis? Because we're having warmer winters, more rain. Um, I'm thinking that is also um, loss of biodiversity because of our warming planet. Um, and uh, maybe we could also work with some uh, climate activists um, to also marry uh, the loss of biodiversity like like bats. I was just thinking, is there a specific um, a website or paper that has, because I'm a scientist, to find out more about uh, wet no uh, white nose uh, syndrome? Yes, there's um, there's so much research out there about white nose syndrome. Um, it has been very like heavily because of the impact that it's been having. Um, it's it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, so there there's a, pl a plethora of literature out there about white nose syndrome. Um, in regards to climate change, climate change uh, is a significant threat to, I mean all 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 life and, and biodiversity, and mm -hmm. bats are one of the one of the one of the animals that are being impacted. Um, it's, how do I say? The, it's kind of like the deforestation and climate change like go hand in hand and that like tearing down a forest is going to like negatively impact the bats like immediately and then in the long term because then you have this um, giant lawn, lawn space that's like True. drought prone and doesn't support much other life True. and then like um, the area basically becomes um, barren for barren for life dead. and like yeah. the ability to like so mm -hmm. the yes it is a it is one of the one of the threats to um to like bats and to to all life um and uh for white nose syndrome um the the cave environment is it's specifically the 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 dampness and the coolness inside of the cave that like allows the fungus to uh 
to thrive. So uh, in regard to climate change, it's um, I don't necessarily think that the fungus itself in a cave like is being directly influenced to, to do better. It's the um, the amount of spaces that have it and the limited spaces that bats have to to use for caves is like the more like direct issue. So like the climate change and like all the habitat destruction limiting where bats can go plus where bats can go has white nose syndrome in it is like the the double-edged sword kind of that's the that's what's going on it could, that's where they need the yeah. connection oh thank you for that that was one of my um one of my main questions so the main um goal is don't you know keep our forests intact mm -hmm. <laughs> to help our population Absolutely. of the bats and various um other species thank you mm -hmm. so much to both of you you've been amazing awesome. and please promote your event that's happening um at the end of october please yeah sure. yeah yeah we're holding our, our our fall gala we're throwing a big a big old party to raise some funds for our work next year um it'll go toward expanding the research that we do um expanding our ability to give organizations uh ecological materials for their um bat sanctuaries et cetera. Et cetera. so Every dollar raised from that is going obviously directly back into this work. If you don't know, we're a registered nonprofit. Um, so we are very closely monitored. So you can be um, sure that any money that goes our way is being used for good. Um, yeah, we're throwing a big old party on the 28th um, at a beautiful brewery in Queens, New York called Ale Life. Um, you can check out more information for it on our website, gothambatcon.org. Um, it's the theme is night wonders, uh, celebrating bats and their nighttime environment. So feel free to dress up, come for music, come to convene with fellow environment lovers. Um, it's going to be a great night. So we'd love to see any and all of you there. Yes, it's so timely. So we hope a lot of folks will join you at that event. It's a wonderful Do you have the name of the place in Staten Island to put in the Ren, the nursery. The nursery. I'm sorry. Yes. Give me one second to like sure. dig it out of my brain. <laughs> so you know, I think we've covered all the questions and I just want to be yeah. sensitive to everyone's time. I mean, this was, I can't tell you the the level of expectation was really high for what we were going to talk about today and all the great learnings. And this so far exceeded expectations. I mean, thank you to everyone who asked questions, amazing questions. Thank you so much to Ryan and Roxanne. I mean, you shared so many insights with us, practical things that we can do in our own yards to support the bats and, and ways that forests like Buttonhook Forest can support the bats and, and things that we need to think about and be conscious about um, to really support all these species which are so vulnerable uh, to everything that you mentioned and, and need to be protected. So thank you for all the amazing work that you do and for spending so much time, so generous with your time with us today. Um, it's been wonderful to, to learn so much from you all. And um, for folks who want to you know, have further questions, you can feel free to post them on the Friends of Buttonhook Facebook pages. Um, we can get back to Ryan and Roxanne if they're if they're comfortable sharing more with us, we'll bring it back um, and share Absolutely. it with Ian, everybody. Um, that would be great. And we will post information about your wonderful event. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just wonderful to, to be working as an ally with you around all of this. And I wanna give a shout out again, you know, friends of, on behalf of Friends of Buttonhook Forest, uh, we really are grateful and we we appreciate to the collaboration with Newcastle Healthy Yards, with uh, Newcastle Pollinator Pathways and with the nature of Westchester. And we look, all look forward to working together to support the bats. So thank you again so thank, much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, please reach out to us with any questions. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and also it's the Greenbelt Native Plant Center in Staten Island. <laughs> 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 and thank you so much again for having us. Of course. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm.